Welcome to Foreigners and Friendship, a series of podcasts. We present a number of bonus tracks connected to our radio show. You can listen to conversations with artists and activists, reports from festivals and other larger events, essays, reviews, poetry and letters. We see ourselves as part of a non-binary rebellion with the intention of creating a language and a human condition by on race, ethnicity, gender, sex and class. Tear down these walls, dismantle the statues of power and meet the other with an open spirit. We are in Lagos, Nigeria. We have decided to visit this huge urban space despite warnings about crime, violence, terror and kidnapping. Already upon arrival, we have an impression it will be a cool experience in contradiction with all these wild rumors. Our primary purpose or excuse is to participate in a key Arts and Book Festival, which has been run by the Nigerian poet and author Lola Shonin. But Lagos as a space has for a long time been on our wishing list. Therefore we arrived early, nine days before the festival. It turned out to be a very good decision, not only because it gave us the possibility to explore the city before the beginning, of the busy schedule of the festival days, but also because then we were able to take part in the press conference held in the week prior to the festival and have a conversation with the director Lola Shonien in a more relaxed atmosphere and environment. To the press meeting, Lola Shonien introduces the festival tells about the 10 years of experience and present the main sponsor of the festival sitting next to her from Sterling Bank. During the press session she is asked by a Lagos bait journalist how she is doing it without the government and her answer is not very surprising but also somewhat depressing. We for our own part, ask her how it influences the festival that she actually is an active poet and writer herself. Before she gives an answer, she makes sure the room gives us a round of applause to welcome us and she explains that it is actually very important that people from far away come and show interest in what they are doing here in Lagos. This is the press conference introducing the 2023 edition of the Ake Arts and Book Festival, which also happens to be the 11th edition. So we have come quite a way from 2013 when we held the first edition. This year we have a total of 28 different events, which include book chats, panel discussions, a film screening, our famous palm wine and poetry festival, uh, sorry, poetry night. We have a concert which will feature Bantu playing some of the classics that we all know and love. And we have some receptions as well. So one of the receptions is um, a publish her event, which is specially for women in publishing. And this is sponsored by an organization in the UAE called Publish Her, which is run by Sheikha Badur al um, who is a Sheikha of Sharjah in the UAE. And um, Publish Her um, is an organization that seeks to support women in publishing, and I happen to be on the board, and I was able to convince them to do something to support women in publishing on the African continent. So they are also funding one of the panel discussions which features women 
in publishing on the African continent. We are also doing the Africa Connect um, reception where African writers, especially the Nigerians, will be able to meet some of the international festival directors who are coming. We also are doing something called the Great African Book Quiz, which everybody will be able to participate in. But we want to check your knowledge of African fiction and writers, especially so many of you who claim to be experts. This is your opportunity. We have a wonderful selection of books that have been donated to us by One, One World Publishers in the UK. So there will be lots of book prizes for the winners of that competition. We also have, with regard to the film screening, actually, Femi Adebayo will be coming. He's very hot right now, having just um, completed the blockbuster series called Jagun Jagun. So we're very excited about looking at some of the behind the scenes footage and also having a chat with the man himself. I understand there's another actress coming, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to surprise everyone. We have 72 guests who will be joining us. And out of that 72, 55 of them will be coming from outside the country. So we're flying in writers from 17 different countries, both in Africa and outside Africa. We introduced a new initiative this year called the Festival Directors Fellowship. After Ake Festival hosted the Global Association of Literary Festivals Conference last year, one of the ideas that came out of it was how wonderful it would be if festival directors could visit other festivals around the world. I have benefited from this immensely, um, going to different festivals in my capacity, both as a writer and a festival director, and even as a publisher. And we want to give back, and we want to show that Nijano de Kari last. We shouldn't always be the ones who are uh, taking all the time. We should also do something and give back. And for that reason, we sent out an, an invitation for different festival directors around the world to apply. And I'm delighted to say that we have six incredible festival directors who will be joining us this year. Willemay Lamp will be joining us from the Read My World Festival in the Netherlands. Teresa Groton will be joining us from the Bergen Literary Festival in Norway. Estefania Calanes Perez and Angeles Jurado are joining us from the festival in Las Palmas de Gran Canaria in Spain. We have Lavinia Frey, who is the director of the Berlin International Festival. So she'll be coming in from Germany. And we also have the pleasure of having Holod Sager, who will be joining us from Sweden. So we have six festival directors, and they will be the ones on the Africa Connect panel. So people will be able to ask them questions, and I will also be able to grill them on what they have seen and what they have learned and how they have conquered Nigeria. The other thing that we introduced this year is TARF, which is T-A-R-F, and this stands for the Africa Rights Forum. The idea behind this is that in my travels around the world, especially as a bookseller and as a publisher, it has come to my attention that there are so many important streams of income that Nigerians and African publishers are not pursuing. So when you go to international book fairs of the world, so this year alone I've been to Sharjah Book Fair, I've been to the Frankfurt Book Fair, and when I was at the Frankfurt Book Fair, it was interesting to me that even in the room, there were about 150 people, and myself and my daughter were the only black faces that were there. And of course, I brought that to their attention. And I said, what this does is that it speaks to the inequity that occurs in the book industry. The Western publishing establishment love our talent. 
but it's time for us to get involved. And that includes us on the African continent. Also upping our game, making sure that we improve the standard of our work so that we can also put forward our talent. And when it comes to these international marketplaces, it means that we will have a seat at the table. Without the appropriate skills, this would be very complicated. So the Africa Rights Forum is committed to providing training, to upskilling anyone who has been invited to collaborate and join us in gaining the necessary skills to be able to participate in the international book trade marketplaces of the world. And to make this happen, what I decided to do was to bring in some experts. So some of our facilitators for the two-day conference are Emma Shercliffe, who is coming from England, Lucy Campos is coming from France, Pierre Astier is coming from France, and Stephanie Steiker will be coming in from the US. These individuals are all agents and editors. So they're coming to give two, a two-day training um, at the conference and support the attendees, right, get right into the nitty gritty of what this work is. But apart from that, um, it's important to also announce that we have commenced a partnership with the UNDP and the Nigerian Jubilee Fellows. And this means we are going to be training in the first instance, 21 individuals in the art of agenting and editing. There's very little support from the state. And also sometimes you have no model, no models to work with. And that results in a situation where you are having to build from scratch. So this is one of those situations where we want to ensure that we are at this point already thinking about the next generation of publishers. I believe very much that creative people are the last bastion of the truth. It's very difficult to trust politicians, but I think the way that creative people, artists, writers, poets interpret the world, make sense of the world, is very important. What we're trying to do now is moving away from the having a headliner and elevating every single person who participates um, to the same level. Um, if you look over here, you'll see the Aki Review, which has on the cover the faces of the individuals and the fantastic writers who have um, graced Aki Festival with their presence over the last nine years. So even with the Ake Review, with this model, you can see we've had Abdu Azat Gurna, Walesho Ika, Nuruddin Farah, Ngugi Wakiongo, Ama Ata Aidu, and so on. And uh, we're moving away from this model as well. Even the publication is going to look different. But the idea is to really celebrate every single person who comes. When we started our key festival, we did have that goal. We wanted to spend some time honoring the generation that have that really opened the road for us. But I think we've grown up now. We've spent uh, ten years doing that, and we also want to reinvent the festival and do things differently. We have in the past done a huge number of workshops for writers, for poets for filmmakers, and no matter how much we keep developing the creatives, there is an infrastructure that should support those creatives. And where that is absent, what will keep happening is that those, create, those people who are creating, create writing books, will continue to be adopted by the Western um, publishing establishment. It's not as if we do not have the talent to be able to promote, market, support, edit writers here. But in certain areas of publishing, we are currently in a somewhat weakened state. 
Anybody who tells you that in terms of literary output, Nigerians are not performing or Africans is not telling you the truth. You can look at all these books here. Many of them produced and written by African and Nigerian authors. But specifically, we are trying to build the infrastructure around these creatives. That's what we're not getting right. And we're in the business of correcting and building the institutions that are non-existent. How do I go about it without government? Yes. How have I gone about everything without government? Sometimes it's easier to build things without government. And that's the truth. Especially when it's creative. And creativity and this sort of sector, if it is one thing that it needs, it's freedom to be able to operate. Sometimes government brings distraction, but also it can be an encumbrance, an obstacle to one's achievements. I, I just decided that it was best, it was safer, it was more convenient, it was less stressful to work with the private sector and some of these international agencies and donors that have been so supportive of our work. The question to ask is why has government not been involved in what we are doing? I think that's the important question as well. If government, if you are a body, I pay my taxes. Everybody here, we pay our taxes religiously. But government has not thought to themselves, okay, this festival that has become the biggest one in sub-Saharan Africa, that's churning out some of these incredible writers and starting all these initiatives and building this infrastructure. Nobody from government has come to say, how can we support? However, I have been in contact with the governor of Lagos State. And I just want to say that things look promising. And I also should highlight that Kaduna Book and Arts Festival, which we also organize, used to be completely funded by the Kaduna State Government. And that was a very unique experience for me. And we, they would ask for our budget, we would give it to them. They would say they would pay for certain things and they would give us the rest and say, go and deliver this festival for our people. But there are exceptions to the rule, is the point I'm trying to make. We've had very negative experiences but in Kaduna State, it was the easiest, the most stress-free, and the most supportive state government I've ever worked with in my life. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very um, excited uh, to be here and to look forward to this week. Uh, I often, when I come to literary festivals and also other types of festivals in, in, in other art forms, the organizers are, are not practicing artists, they are organizers, maybe because it takes so much time, so they don't have time for it. But it strikes also other people who are. But in this case, at least you are a practicing author and have been in for many years. So I'm curious, what do you think that this has some kind of influence on how RK Festival has been shaped or or how do you view that? Does it give another kind of structure and content of the festival than if you would have been not practicing literature. Thank you so much for that. And um, this is our friend who has come in from Denmark. He requested a press pass from us and he wanted to come and attend the festival. Can you please just help me welcome him with a round of applause? Um, may not fully understand what it means when we are doing things here. We give ourselves so much bad press. We use our own mouths to say how terrible we are sometimes. But one of the wonderful things about organizing a festival has been that opportunity to project the best about us. And in doing so, we also attract a lot of good eyes internationally. So here we have a journalist who has come 
to get to know our country, but also who wants to attend the festival. And we're delighted to have you. I think, yeah, I see what you mean. And, and I totally see the advantages of the organizers not themselves being creatives. The, the biggest reason is that when you're doing this and you're committed to building infrastructure and supporting culture, I think your work as a creative suffers immensely. Um, people keep asking me why I haven't published my second novel. This is why, okay? <laughs> Being a writer has been a huge advantage because I have moved around the world talking about my books, talking about the festival, and I've been able to observe. I've been able to spend decades observing. I've been able to spend some time stealing good practice. So when I go somewhere and I like what they're doing, the first thing that's going on in my mind is, how can I adapt this for Nigeria and for Aki Festival? But it also gives me quite a unique perspective when it comes to the way black people are received, are treated at international festivals. A lot of the time when you look at the lineup, you'll have one or two token black faces, two, one or two Africans on the list. One of the experiences I had very early on was I would find myself at an event, for instance, in Germany, and there wouldn't be a single black face in the audience. And they'd be asking me questions about Baba Segi. Questions that uh, they will say, yeah, so tell us about this polygamy that goes on in, in, in Nigeria. Will it ever be stamped out? And I want to tell the truth that, well, the poverty and the situation means it may not be stamped out in the near future. But I will now be something inside me will now be say, don't say that, don't say that in front of all these people. They will now be looking at you people like village idiots, <laughs> you know. So I, I thought to myself that actually what we need is a forum where when I talk about polygamy and I'm talking to an African audience, I don't need to provide context. I don't need to explain myself. I just talk. And I think that is what has been most valuable for a lot of the writers that have attended this festival. So I come at the organization with, a certain, with certain sensibilities and an understanding of what goes on outside and how that informs how differently I must do things on, the, you know, on African soil. And here we center we have always centered African narratives and African writers, and we go over and beyond to honor them and to make them feel that they are home and that we fully value and appreciate the work that they have given the world. And all that is possible because I know how it feels when I'm on the other side. But is this, is this because of your um, your identity or your experience as a poet or is this also um because you're talk some of the things you're talking about is, is is also is not only you being a poet but also you being uh, in being in contact where people are seeing you as what can we call it the other uh, and i mean and, and and this is a very strange um, Identity to have this idea of, of, of othering if you if you are always somewhere where people look at you. So I'm just wondering: is this a, a poet identity, or is it is it also a more general feeling of of having of having the role of in, interpretation? I've been in a lot of spaces of, um, all over the world, and let's just say that. I'm very aware of the othering. I'm very aware often of the differences. I'm very aware sometimes of, um, of, of, of how people see me and what their expectations are. 
But my response to that has always been being extremely natural and actualizing my own pursuit of excellence. And I think excellence and standards are universal. So when I present myself, I always try to put my best foot forward because I realize that because of my position, my behavior impacts how those other people in those spaces see Africans, see Nigerians. So I'm, I'm often not just going there, you know, as myself. And it is a big burden um, sometimes, but it's one that I'm happy to subject myself to for the benefit of my people as a whole. After these very long and elaborating snapshots, hardly a very accurate expression of what we normally would perceive as snap shootings. But in the process, so much of what was said appeared too relevant to leave out. In the afternoon on the same day, we met Lola Shonying for a conversation in her office upstairs in the building. We are here in Lagos, Nigeria. We are here to attend the Arcade Arts and Book Festival. And we are together with the director and founder of the festival, Lola Shun Shunin. Yes. Is that correct? Shunay. Shunin. You are impressively a very decorated uh, poet and writer, I realized after researching you with a lot of prizes and you're also the founder of this festival and have also founded other kind of uh, literary institutions and also actually the the bookshop we are in right now is also uh, your initiative, which yes. I understand is also a, a publishing house. Yes. And I can see there's, there's art, visual art on yes. the, uh, in the rooms also, so it's maybe also an entertainment. We, we use house. it as a, as a walkthrough gallery okay. sometimes, so the entire premises, I mean, the whole of last year, we would have three artists here every okay. month oh, okay. um, exhibiting okay. their works, so people would just come into the office and go into the different spaces. Oh, okay. Usually what I do is, uh, to uh, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself also because I think it's nice to for everyone to be able to decide who they are themselves. Okay. So please, please. So my name is Lola Shone and I am a, a reader, a writer, a publisher, a bookseller, a festival organizer, and a culture activist. Originally, when you started this initiative, what, what made you do that? Because I mm. mean, a lot of poets or writers would mm. just continue the writing mm. and pursue that but you somehow chose to go into this mm. uh, infrastructure building mm. and institutional building and also with maybe some care and mm. consideration towards younger mm. people in the in the in the area mm. so what made you was like was this a conscious uh, yeah. decision or was it just something that happened it's a combination of things and i guess the stars just aligned in a way that allowed me to be somebody who produces cultural events and somebody who can invest resources even my own personal resources into the development of of literature in my country and on my continent a lot of it comes from my journey my own personal journey i i was introduced to some very important and significant writers when I was as young as 22, when I used to attend the monthly events that were organized by the Association of, of Nigerian Authors. Over the years, that organization has kind of taken on a different role within the literary establishment. And then when my book came out, um, in in when I was 22, my first collection of poetry was published. I founded my first publishing house when I was 23 because I could see a gap and I could see a need. And I was really desperate to push female voices mm -hmm. that had a sort of feminist um, sensibilities. 
but I didn't know enough then when I was 23 and I had so much to learn about organizing events and throughout my life everywhere that I have lived in uh, except perhaps the UK where I simply didn't have the confidence I have always been involved in establishing some sort of monthly literary event first to foster this sense of community that every creative person needs but also to give people a platform to perform their own works I just see very clearly and vividly the value of that in society. I often say that institutions like the festival, for instance, I, I was very keen to give religious establishments some competition um, because I think it's dangerous how the pursuit of religion has sort of fundamentally captured the imagination of a whole cohort of the country, both in the North and in the South, in its entirety, you know, and in a way that doesn't leave space for the arts, for beauty, for culture, for reading, for books. So I really wanted something, um, an, an option to provide people with an alternative sort of event mm -hmm. that they could go to or an alternative way of engaging mm -hmm. with the world. Yeah. That one that's value and one that often and almost always has a really positive impact on the people who are consuming it. And then when I left teaching in, in 2012, I really wanted to do something that, that allowed me to pursue my loves and the things that I actually loved doing. I'd risen to the position of deputy principal and I knew I didn't want to become a principal because in my view that just created more distance between me and the students and it's the, the contact with the students that I actually loved as a teacher. That's when I knew I had to leave as the pressure mounted for me to kind of take things to the next level. I knew I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something that combined all the you know, the things that I that, that that are precious to me. So literature, reading, culture, history, performance, poetry, literature and um and that's what I did. So when I left teaching it was a question of okay, so how do I make this happen? And of course in twenty twelve I'd also had that experience with promoting my own book in other markets and territories and finding it sometimes a little bit uncomfortable, um, finding some of the questions I was being asked uncomfortable, um, and realizing that everywhere I went, I was constantly having to provide context, mm -hmm. which sometimes didn't give me enough time to talk about the things that I thought were really important. And also the idea that even the audience that I'm speaking to, when I want to crit be critical of a cultural practice. Mm -hmm. I want to say it to the people mm -hmm. who are engaged with that cultural practice. It, it's more meaningful to me when I'm saying it in other spaces. It just looks like I'm almost demeaning my own people. And I wanted to give other people that opportunity. So I call it home love. When you are on the African continent and you're an African writer, the sort of adoration that you get when you come to Aki Festival is very different from the quality of the sort of adoration you might get in any other part of the world. Mm. And I think it's important for every writer as well to have that experience. It's so great for their confidence, but also being able to talk, like we say, eyeball to eyeball with other Africans. I think it's also worth so much. And a lot of them come and they give back. They do workshops, they run trainings for other writers. It's been an incredible journey, but that's really how it started. Sometimes in this connection month, between different art forms, is, this, is there a tradition for that in Nigeria? or Because, I mean, in, in a lot of parts of the world, you have this separation between different yeah. art forms. Visual art is one thing, mm. and video choice is something else. Film is video another. Is somehow for itself, often... Uh, and and also kind of an an art form of solitude mm, somehow. Right? Mm. Uh, so therefore, I'm I'm very interested in this cross aesthetic mm. uh, perspective. Mm. So I'm wondering, is is there kind of a tradition for that in, in Nigeria? Not really. Not really. That? It's just something that I started doing. Yeah. All, I mean, and to be honest with you. When I first started the festival, I realized if you just called something just a book festival, 
then other people who are into film or art are just like, ugh, I don't want to be part of that. Yeah. But once I realized that I can get people to come for other art forms and still stay for the books, yeah. and you're able to show them how other art forms are also just forms of storytelling, yeah. like yeah. literature, we have been able to um, convert a lot of people to, yeah. to yeah. engaging with literature in a, in a really meaningful way just by attending the festival, which they actually attended for something else entirely. Yeah, I met a lot of artists actually uh, over the years that, that, that are talking about that. We are doing storytelling, but this story maybe fits for this art form, but another yeah. story will fit for, for theater because yeah. it is fitted for that. So, so that different art forms can also be seen as, as media or kind of perspective. Well, exactly. And then that's, we, we used to have even a play Every year we would stage a play at Ake and there would be people who, like I said, would come just for that. And then suddenly they're introduced to the world of other things we're doing. And out of curiosity, they might come the next day and say, OK, let me check, you know, what's happening with them, um, with the books. What book? Oh, that writer, I've heard about that person. Let me even just see. And from there, they just become a convert and somebody who then comes to the festival and and with um with young people as well because they know we we bring together so many we bring books from all over the world yeah. to the festival and we sell them at a really big discount at the festival bookstore many people save up money throughout the year to come to, come to the festival okay. just for their books okay. so they get their book haul for the year, the year oh. from Ake festival and you, they might just be readers that is but, actually interesting yeah. development, I think, that, that is. No, it's, yeah. it's really wonderful. Um, I mean, this kind of stuff that I have learned from, from producing this festival and the little things that have come to my attention. A lot of, a lot of them really incredible. Yeah. And it really allows us to serve the community. Yeah. And, and I love that. that yeah. That's a big part yeah. of who I am. I love the idea of being able to do useful yeah. and helpful things. Yeah. But that is, I guess, also what, what art should do, kind of, be yeah. part of a community. Right? The one thing I love about this work that I do, it's really just about people. It allows individuals to find their own communities within yeah. the larger community. And that, that for me is a very powerful thing. The idea that because of some of what we do, people just feel less isolated. Mm. Nigeria can be very difficult and those communities are critical to one's comfort and, and existence sometimes. So, when you're saying that Nigeria can be difficult, what do you mean by that? Just complicated. There are lo there's a lot of poverty, but I think the most um, one of the most challenging things for me is how culture is is just not valued by government, for instance. So we don't have an arts council that works. We don't have systems and structures that find talent and nurture talent um, till they're at a level where they're operating both nationally and internationally. And I, I see it as such a waste. There's just so much waste of talent. And government has also made itself into a bit of a dragon. Hold on. Come in. It's our, it's our coffee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shola. Appreciate it. There's yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. In the press conference, you were you were yeah. talking about this. How, how are you, you? There was a question: How are you doing this without? Planning? I know. And then you can counterbalance it by saying that your partner was sitting next to you, which is one of the biggest yes, banks, the in, banks in, yeah. in, in Nigeria. Yeah. And and I always find this this idea of who is who is the best partners, government or or private enterprise, and somehow private enterprises. Is of course they are in the world of making yeah. money, yeah. but they are also maybe more free in terms of if they if they decide to support art and culture, 
then you will get more kind of free, free yeah. spirit in relationship. Absolutely. Because government is often very restrictive. Concerned about yeah, a little bit conservative in some way. Yeah. In terms of how they support Problem is that there's conservatism. There's also a total lack of know-how. The civil service is almost always people who are unskilled within culture. They're not cultural organizers or cultural managers or have ever produced anything cultural in their own lives. So for them, it's about sending people off to events internationally. It's not about the building. Well, it means you have not employed people who have knowledge in the area. Well, people but you are employing just. Well, people. If you look at the way the civil service yeah. works and the kind of individuals who are operating within it, they are. They sometimes can be rather myopic for yeah. no fault of theirs, mm -hmm. but because of the way the system is. A lot of the stuff that I am doing, and that's why you often hear the word building, mm -hmm. is new. It's working with new technologies. It's me also farming ideas and, and look, going around the world, mm. seeing best practice, what works, and adapting it for my country yeah. in a way that the typical civil servant simply cannot. Yeah. They are very focused on other things. So it means when those partnerships happen, there's a lot of teaching that needs yeah. to be done. They need to understand me. I need to understand them. It's very time consuming. And even with the sort of freedom that I need to be able to ex practice the freedom to have the kind of guests that I want, mm. sometimes when there are restrictive laws, it means I then have to be sort of um, underhand about the yeah. way that I bring certain personalities to the festival and I don't want that or oh, you mean if, if, if you for want instance to someone who who's gay of, yeah, or, yeah. Or, or you know what I mean yeah. or LGBTQI yeah. plus I mean suddenly you have to kind of you might find yourself in a situation where you're having to answer certain sorts of yeah. questions or your certain sorts of questions are being posed to me and I, I just I don't want that because humanity is is what's most important to me yeah I don't, I'm not interested in what people are. I'm interested in what they have to contribute yes, exactly. to the many conversations yes, yes. that are always going on in, about yes. us, about yes. Africanness, and about Africa's relationship with the rest of the world. Yeah, and then, of course, it's important to get people with, with different experiences. Exactly. And, and who come from different uh, communities. Exactly. Uh, instead of a mono kind of culture yeah. or a yeah. perspective. We have yeah. to normalize difference. Yeah. And I hope that people can look at the work that I do and from there develop better ideas, but also understand that things are possible. And I hope that sort of stimulates them to, to want to replicate or do even better than I have done. And, and also I, I often talk about the pursuit of excellence. Sometimes I really do feel that young people do not have models here anymore because mm -hmm. the political class is so disconnected from reality so even at our events starting events on time treating people with a certain level of respect and the respect to be reciprocated that is the culture of the festival and it's the culture that i think we can really build on Ake is a place where everybody can ask a question. Everybody can talk to some of these big, larger-than-life writers. Building a, a space where there's just mutual respect and eagerness to, to dialogue and understand the differences that we have. And of course, these processes and this promotes tolerance and and it, that's one thing that's in short supply. People just need to be a little bit more tolerant of what is different from them. So that's also something at the back of my mind that I'm hoping my work will, will contribute to. Thank you very much. Well, it's a Thank, pleasure you. To talk to you. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. You have listened to a bonus track by Foreignness and Friendship.
if you have built up an appetite for more, then you can follow us on thewhiteafricanblogspot.com and walk in our footsteps by stepping into In My Footstep WordPress.com. We broadcast new episodes of our radio show every first Tuesday of the month available on your preferred platforms.